Hi, I'm Michael Smith for Nevada Trails. Today I have a very special show. I have Senator James Settlemeyer. Welcome to the show. Pleasure to be here, Michael. I, uh, I had to kind of laugh the other night. I shot the, um, the debate, mm -hmm. and you were so calm and collective and just kind of getting up and speaking after the first debate. And I thought, boy, there's a lot less pressure on a guy who has running unopposed. It is a lot easier way to run. They always say you can either run scared or you can run unopposed. And so I've never had the opportunity until now to run unopposed, and I, I do like this. Well, it shows. So. You're so relaxed. But in any case, when uh, you we were talking, it kind of made me back to the old days. I think it was about 10 years ago when uh, Deborah and I moved to the uh, the Valley. And you and Kelly Kite were really tight and really friendly and things. And uh, I remember, I, I think I was here about three weeks in the uh, Sierra Nevada Republican Women. And Amade and Heller were there, I think it was, that night. And I I asked Amade about, I just said, I just moved here from Michigan, and uh, I, I see a growing meth problem. What are you going to do about it? And he said, why don't you move back to Michigan? <laughs> 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 Welcome to politics in Carson Valley. <laughs> uh, and then he, he just kind of blew off the answer. Yeah. But um, it was a problem. But anyways, also your wife uh, was so nice to us. Um, Deborah was nice enough to win the uh, Entrepreneur of the Year Correct. Award that year. I remember and that. And she presented it. So a lot of fond memories. Oh, yeah. But anyways, I was going to ask you, uh, with the political environment, what did you think about the debates? I mean, um, I was kind of confused about the lieutenant governor one. Maybe you could mm -hmm. help me out. Supposedly through the grapevine, the governor is going to run for Senate in two years. You know, you, who knows what the future is going to bring. Uh, some people, of course, are looking at that concept of the governor running uh, against Harry Reid in two years. Some people are saying the governor will run for Congress in some district, or maybe he'll, you know, decide to run in four years or maybe he's decided you know or will decide that he wants out of politics you know the, the future's not very well written and who knows what the next four years will bring you know? well that's exactly why i was confused because until that debate i already had it written that he was going mm -hmm. and the debate would be about them becoming governor well it wasn't about them becoming governor it was them about being in charge of tourism and some Correct. other issues is that what you saw too or is i misreading it i think it's important that you run for the job you want you know uh, the job you're running for so again, the lieutenant governor's job is a focal point of tourism. It is to be the president of the Senate, to be there to basically settle disputes, uh, vote only when you know, absolutely necessary, uh, which hasn't happened in a long time. It did happen this last legislative session. It did happen? Uh, on about eight or 10 bills, uh, unfortunately. It, it was a sad situation. Uh, unfortunately, a, a lady's husband was passing and she made the very right choice of being with her husband as he passed. Well, that makes sense. But then that created a situation where the partisan votes came in at a 10-10 tie. Well, the reason I was shocked on that answer was the, um, was it Loud? She Loud? said, mm -hmm. Loud said it, uh, it would never happen. So that's why I remember said, well, yeah. it, you know, I'll it, be there, but it'll never happen. But to my knowledge, it hadn't happened. The last time that it happened prior to Brian Krolicki weighing in as the deciding vote, was all the way back to the time, I think it was uh, Lonnie Hamagern. So that goes back uh, a few generations, uh, decades at least. I can't remember when Lonnie was lieutenant governor. I want to say 20, 30 odd years ago. Wow. So in that respect, it, it, it has not happened in a long time. Uh, it's very rare that the Senate is evenly split or you know, even close, 11-10, which then if somebody's gone, it can make a, a difference. Uh, but it's... As far as being a political question, it's more of a question if the governor does decide to do something, then yes, the lieutenant governor would step up. Actually, I like your answer because if they presumed that it was going to happen, it would make them look stupid too. It's oh, no. kind of a double-edged sword. I guess they're smarter by not doing that. I don't think it's a situation. I think that you know that's a decision that the governor will have to make in the future, what his political future will decide to bring, or maybe he'll decide that he wants out. You know, I remember Lynn Hetrick telling that to me. You, you enter into politics uh, on the concept of trying to do what's best for the community and the citizens of the state. And if you do a good enough job, term limits will basically occur because you get very frustrated and you don't have to worry about the ballot. It'll just naturally occur because it's time to take a break and go back, per se, to the real world. Well, I think Lynn was probably the most, one of the most uh, intelligent men I've ever met. Mm -hmm. He's Definitely. a great man. Yeah. Well, as far as some of the things that are affecting um, your own personal ranch, mm -hmm. there seems to be more and more fighting over uh, things like that. Um, uh, water rights and, and, oh. and uh, sage grouses and tor tortoises. and I mean, what's going on with all this stuff? It's, it shouldn't, in my opinion, you have a ranch just like your domain. Mm -hmm. And if you have sage grouse or turtles or whatever, you should be able to be 
being able to take care of all those, you're charged with that to take care of those. It would be a lot easier than then them turning it into government land. Well, uh, it, endangered species act is going to kill us. It has very uh, far-reaching effects. The the concept of the sage grouse being listed as threatened or endangered uh, creates a situation where the management areas kick in, and therefore you are not allowed if you're going to graze on public lands, or the things you do affect public entities such as, or public things such as water then it comes into the mix too. So all of a sudden, the way you normally utilize water changes, even on your own property. Uh, those are effects, and, and the reality is with agriculture, it, it's interdependent. So if we were to lose, let's say, 20% of the agriculture within the state of Nevada, the rest of the agriculture would implode upon itself just due to the fact it doesn't have the support mechanism. Uh, Douglas County, we've uh, faced that here a long time ago. Uh, you know, we're in... Uh, we're across from what used to be old case hardware a long, long time ago. Well, as we started to lose the ability to get parts, it became very problematic. Now with the internet and uh, UPS, FedEx, uh, United States Postal Service doing overnight delivery, we've gotten some of that back, but there's an infrastructure of mechanics to fuel delivery to everything else that if we lose too much ag, it could cause a rest to fail just by being near it. And so that's something we have to look at as a state. What do we want our future to be? I think it's important to protect the sage grouse to the best of our ability, but let's not forget this is still something we hunt. Yeah. There's still a season on them. <laughs> yeah. So how threatened or endangered are they really? And I think the biggest issue that comes down to it, though, is I think that Congressman Amade said it best, that the federal government, owns the land, the majority of the state of Nevada. They control the funding. They also control the department in charge of those endangered species. And they're telling us that we're doing it wrong? <laughs> well, uh, I'm, I'm laughing because that same department, uh, according to my bird experts, and mm -hmm. I have a lot of bird experts for some reason. I'm for the birds, I guess. Well, that's good. But anyway, <laughs> but anyways, they said this department put up like cameras and studied them and stakes and monitored and, yeah. and the fox or the, or the, or the um, coyote got smart and just kind of waited where those cameras were and got to ate a lot of them. <laughs> plus, <laughs> plus those same people were throwing their lunch out of their car and fed the coyotes too and drew them to that area too. Just a rumor. I don't know if that's fact 100%. According to my bird people, that's, uh, that, that happened. Well, one of the biggest problems we do have with the sage grouse is you can look at all the studies that show that its main predator is not man. Its main predator is not coyotes. Its main predator is a raven. Exactly. And that is controlled by the Federal Migratory Bird Act. Now, some states have done what I think is wise and asked for permission to go over the set quota of how many of the predatorial birds, the ravens, that can be harvested out of the wild. And since this is the main predator, the sage grouse, it, it doesn't take a lot to realize if we were to cut down the raven numbers, it would increase the sage grouse numbers. You're the first person who agrees with me that on anything. <laughs> the raven, I think, are to blame for the the, the tortoises getting killed because till mm -hmm. they're like eight years old, they can get through the shell and they're eating them. Right. And they, 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 the cattle, they're they're well, what's the word? I don't know. They get along with each other, no problem. And uh, the raven up in my area, up in Tahoe, they take out the trash more than the bears do, and the bears get the blame. Oh yeah. These are smart birds, and they're big birds. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we should get rid of a few ravens. Well, you know, and that's something that I think as a state we need to look at management-wise and decide what's what's best overall for the citizens of the state of Nevada, but also the economy. And with the sage grouse, there are so many bad effects. You know, the unintended consequences if that bird is declared. And again, though, at the same time, I think we're fighting uphill because so far when a, a species is brought in and questioned on whether or not it should be listed as threatened or endangered, uh, so far there's not a good record of things changing. Uh, I was talking to some of the people saying, well, okay, how many of these uh, protests do you put into the, you know, into the federal government in relation to, you know, arguments saying that no, this bird should not be listed or this should not happen to the Endangered Species Act? And they said, we've done over a thousand. How much success have you had in changing even the wording or the outcome? And they said none. <laughs> and I, I, that was very sad to hear. Well, uh, that was my next question, actually, was all these conservation groups are throwing out statistics about certain areas, and mm -hmm. it's just, the meddling is just so much. As a, uh, a senator, how do you get the real facts? I mean, there's so many different stats. Just like on the wild mm -hmm. horses, everyone has different stats for the same thing. I don't know. No. How do you get everybody to work together? I think what the biggest trick is you have to stick with the individuals that are set out to try to get a non- 
uh, jaded view to get the most impartial view out there. Those are the individuals I go to for the facts. I tend to believe that the horse groups, whether they be pro or con, tend to have a different opinion of the outcome that could guide their decisions and their fact findings. So generally I do stick with the endow information or other information that is from an impartial source. Of course that's like anything when you do your homework, you make sure to find impartial answers rather than trying to find biased ones. Well, yeah, the hard thing is as a rancher, you, you got to take care of your family and you know, you know it affects yourself. And I just think there's so much stuff that you have to deal with. When do you have time to actually study for your job, by the way? Oh, well, you know, uh, the ability to internet is a wonderful thing in that respect. Uh, a lot of the things that we do now at the legislature is now gone to digital. So instead of getting a binder that's about three to four inches tall of paperwork, you can actually access it from your iPhone, your iPad, or your internet account, or something of that nature, anywhere you get the World Wide Web. So it's created a tremendous opportunity. Uh, occasionally, sadly, you have to go on trips. Uh, so you'll be in Washington, D.C. or something. It gives you an opportunity at the airport to catch up quite <laughs> oh, a bit on your reading. Uh, so again, it, there, there's always, it, it's hard to manage, but it can be done. It, you know, I remember talking to a Selman Ira Hansen, same situation. He found himself having to come in three hours prior to the meeting just to be able to do all the homework, per se, for that meeting. Of course, sometimes if you wait uh, till just before, it's a little bit too late because sometimes you run across things and it's like, hey, wait, I need to contact the head of this department or I need to contact this one person over here that has this concern on this issue and figure out if we can try to solve that issue. Excellent. Well, we're going to take a, a short break. When we come back, we're going to talk more with Mr. Sillemeyer about certain issues. I've Thank learned. you very much.
Hi, we're back with Senator James Settlemeyer, and uh, so far I had to, I do, um, I like to shoot museums and do cultural mm -hmm. affairs stuff. And when I was shooting the museum in Genoa, it seemed like your family was well represented in, that, in the museum. Could you tell me about that? Uh, my family actually came over here from uh, Westphalia Halle, West Germany in 1880. They worked for a ranch for 10 years, saved up enough money to buy a ranch. Uh, I've been working my whole life, can't afford an acre. You know, things have changed considerably. Uh, with that respect, though, they had this great idea they were going to make a fortune raising apples for Virginia City. Well, after the first freeze around here, that kind of showed that that idea wasn't going to work <laughs> too well. So they got more into the cattle and uh, also the raising of hay for those cows. Uh, in the same respect, we had one cousin that decided to go off into the dairy, so they're the ones that are in Genoa, and, uh, Frank Settlemeyer and Sons. I uh, had another cousin, that uh, Fred Settlemeyer, who was also in the state senate, interesting enough. He was that's, actually the that's one. That's the one that's uh, mm -hmm. prominently displayed at the museum. Is right. Fred was around the community for a long time, very active. Uh, West Point went there for two years, came back here. Uh, again, he, he was in the state senate for a long time. He actually showed Raggio the ropes when Raggio was a freshman, so that Excellent. goes back a few years ago. Yes. <laughs> so, but my family's always had a long history of giving back to the community and being involved. So, yeah. So you had those seeds in your mind as a, as a kid that you were going to do this? You know, it was always a situation where you always give back to the community. You know, I watched my dad on the school board for 12 years. My grandfather was a you know, county commissioner. I got done with college, came back, and was on a local conservation district. And uh, interesting enough, I, there was a meeting that was occurring in Yarrington. And unfortunately, I couldn't make that meeting because I had a piece of equipment break down. And I got a call from the governor saying, congratulations. I asked him what for. He says, oh, you missed the meeting. Oh. And I said, yeah, I did. Why, Governor? He goes, well, James, you're now on the Nevada Conservation Commission. <laughs> so uh, with that, I ended up becoming the chairman of that and testifying on numerous issues at the legislature. And then I worked with my predecessor, Len Hetrick, and he says, you know, I really think you'd be the right person for this job. We talked about it for a long time, and I decided to run for office. Excellent. Well, I always thought you were like, you're still going up the, the ladder and even considered governor, and you said you would never do that to your wife. <laughs> I'm okay right <laughs> But now. she's got you so far right here, okay? And you, you thanked her at the meeting. I thought that was very nice. Yeah. She's a great lady, and it's a, you know, it's, a, it's a great opportunity. I don't know how some of the guys do it down in Clark County that always have to travel up here for 120 days and be away from their families. Oh, I agree. Uh, now, in some respects, it allows them to focus more on the issues and not have to worry about family matters, but yet my family is my strength. And so I, I don't see how they do it. Yet in the same respect, I, I do not want to make their lives easier by moving the capital to them. Yeah. So, you know, we'll see, leave it as it is. <laughs> well, I remember at the other meetings, uh, do you still like get up at the end of the meetings and give people mm -hmm. information? I always thought that was great. You really paid, paid attention to what you, you know, what you read and saw. That was very good. And I, off camera, I made a comment about the um, Walmart's limiting bullets to two boxes. Now, as a politician, if you're shopping at Walmart and I like local stores, but anyways, and you see something like that, does it make you investigate the uh, reasons or concerns or gun sales or, because... Um, you, you'll always it, see just, situations that occur, uh, whether it's something of that nature where you talk to the business and say, hey, what's the reasoning here? And it's a situation where they're trying to uh, make sure that everyone has the opportunity to buy some bullets, because if everybody buys them and hoards them, then the kid who wants to go out uh, target practicing or whatever can't do it. Uh, there'll be other issues that come up where someone will say, hey, I heard this. And so, yeah, you'll have to call a department head to find out if that's necessarily the truth or not, or just rumor and conjecture. Sometimes you'll go home and look it up on the various fact-finding websites just to say, no, sir, that wasn't necessarily true. Here's, here's what's really going on. And, of course, sometimes it leads you down a whole different path. Uh, down in Clark County, the whole issue with the BLM, Bureau of Land Management, pertaining to Clive and Bundy, there's a lot of information there. The BLM was completely, in my mind, wrong for going in guns a-blazing. They brought in the Homeland city. Security. Exactly. Uh, you should never see the BLM with you know, armed weapons in, in that type of a, a situation that should have been done with courts. But in the same respect, too, uh, Mr. Bundy, the, some of the water improvements they, he was claiming were his, weren't his that the government took out. There were actually waters that were being misappropriated by him. So you, you have to get all the facts. Well, both sides were wrong. That's what I oh, looked absolutely. at. It. And it's hard to... Uh, no innocent actor in that situation in either way. Yeah. So I, as a senator, it makes me wonder if you get certain information, you've got to really hold your tongue until you really investigate it. Exactly. And, and that's what it comes down to. You can't make a, a rash decision. It wouldn't be wise to do for the citizens of the state of Nevada in any way, shape, or form. You have to make sure that you have 
the best information available. And sometimes that means stepping away from the situation, delaying it. And we do that on the uh, Nevada State Legislative Commission quite often. We look at regulations and review them. Now, these regulations have all gone through hearings, been properly vetted. But even then, occasionally, you'll have things come up. And it's like, you know what? Could I just have a week or two more to try to find out this answer on this question? Nine times out of ten, there's, there's enough time to say, yeah, we'll go ahead and delay it. So if you have a feeling, you're, you're, some mm -hmm. people are allowed to just exercise that right to get extra time. Trust your gut. Uh, as the old saying goes, just trust your gut and work with your colleagues. And most of your colleagues, they're not, they're not looking to do anything problematic, and they want to get it right. And so you express to them your issues and concerns, and if they're valid issues and concerns, there's never been a problem yet to have it delayed. Now, if your concern is a political one, then no, uh, we'll go ahead and vote it out. <laughs> well, that's, that's another thing I was thinking. But there's so many things that you've got to go through. I, I was just thinking, how do you get the things that you're passionate about out there? I mean, if you, I mean, when you were a young senator, you, you created some bills that were very good for Nevada. Mm -hmm. But weren't they trying to beat you up because you're the, the young guy on the, on the block? Or when, did they give you that respect for winning the office? You know, uh, generally they give you the respect of winning the office. Excellent. Uh, however, you are always, in, if you're in the assembly, you're uh, at a minority. And you're outnumbered two to one, generally from the one party to the other. And it's problematic. Uh, I've seen a lot of great ideas stolen. They'll literally take somebody's idea and put somebody else's name on it and pass it out. Well, if it's good for Nevada, why don't you just keep on doing it? And that's what it comes down to. Just keep coming up with good ideas and you go ahead and let them take it. You know, go ahead and take the idea. I don't necessarily care as long as it has the right effect. Uh, but if you work across the aisle with both sides... You can establish a reputation as, as being a good person and, and trying to do what's best for the state. That's my... And you have that opportunity to, to do that, to work across aisle and get some good things done. Now, are they going to allow uh, maybe your more what they consider radical ideas through? No, that's not going to happen because they control the majority. However, they're not going to stop you from doing things that are not political that are going to try to benefit your community. At least that's the hope. Well, I agree. Some of the candidates running for assembly were talking about um, talking to the federal government, government about getting more lands transferred mm -hmm. back to the state of Nevada. How do you, how would you who, who do you approach about doing that? Well, what it's coming down to is that you can go to a website called the American Lands Council (ALC), and what they've done is they've done some pretty good studies showing how much of the western states are owned by the federal government versus how much of the eastern states exactly. are controlled by the federal government. And if you look at it. Uh, there, there's a definite issue there. Uh, it was a long time ago. There was a western state that actually went to the federal government and said, hey, listen, you control 60-some-odd percent of us, and because of this, we don't have that land to generate property taxes, and therefore, we are not allowed to do infrastructure. We are not allowed to provide enough funding for education, and therefore, the western state of Florida hereby request we get our land back. And now they're down to about 5%. And Nevada needs to go down that road, too. There are some lands we don't want back. Uh, let's face it. If you detonate 217 above-ground nuclear bombs, you may oh. not want that land back. No, I think that's a gimme. Yeah. And so there are also some areas that even if you were to give, let's say, to a rancher and say, go ahead and graze this area, there's not enough feed. And so the rancher could never pay the property taxes, so it doesn't make sense. That's another thing I picked up um, when I was used to growing up in, I didn't grow up, I, when I first moved to Grass Valley, or Garden Valley, I mean, mm -hmm. not too far from here, they said a cow could survive on 10 acres, and then, then they say down south of uh, Nevada, it's like 25 acres. Oh, yeah. Well, how much land can I, you get to even take care of this uh, uh, ranch? Well, I mean, you know, you have some allotments out there that could get up to, you need 40 acres for one cow. Right. Sure. Then you go to the Panhandle area, Texas and so forth, uh, due to the Gulf Coast area with all the moisture there, you literally can have 20 cows on an acre. Oh. So the complete <laughs> inverse of that. Mm -hmm. And so those are things that we have to look at and determine, you know, adequate animal unit months, you know, allotments and things of that nature. But that can be done better, in my opinion, by Nevadans and people interested in the future of the state of Nevada rather than bureaucrats from afar. Well, bureaucratic is, it gets boring at a period of time. What are your passions? What, are, what things do you focus on right now for northern Nevada? I know we always have that north-south thing going, but what can you do for you us? Know, I, I, I mean, think what the do... state as a whole needs to look at the concept of jobs, the economy. We need to get that around here. You know, the, sadly, there are so many jobs that have been lost through the current economy. Uh, you know, yet it's great that in the last couple of years we've created 50,000 new jobs for the area, and those are new jobs and technology and things of that nature. 
also mining. However, the same respect, we've lost about 75,000 jobs. Well, that would, that would actually lower gas prices because since the gas yeah. prices got too high, we couldn't afford to drive anywhere and affected all our groceries. It just, just and it affects everything effect. else. And, but yeah, in the same respect, everybody wants better roads. That's you true. Know? And so I, how do you, I agree. How do you pay for the roads? And that always comes down to the question. If you talk to most of the trucking corporations, they're like, listen, uh, gas tax is at least reasonable because it it's directly goes to the cause. And if you look at gas tax, for every dollar that's collected, 97, 98 cents of it goes back to the roads. If you do a toll road, only about 60% goes back to the road. So you get into these great questions of how do you, what's the proper way to fund the government? I agree. And there are many aspects of the government that everybody wants to see continued. Of course, there are some aspects that many people look at and go, do we really need that? <laughs> I agree. Well, my passion's in uh, cultural affairs and helping Absolutely. out uh, the musicians and things. And it seems like some of our taxes, um, the cabaret tax is wiping out cabarets. And I just don't think we can mm -hmm. afford them. I, I don't know how we can do it. We're down to our last minute. Uh, is there anything you want to address the uh, the public about? It's you know, I, I think just to hit off what you just said about you know museums and cultural affairs, there's a great opportunity out there for anybody. If you haven't purchased a Nevada sequicentennial plate, you know, for the 150th anniversary for the first year, It'll be used to help pay for the 150th anniversary, the celebration, and then after that, that money will go to Museum and Cultural Affairs. So it's a great way to preserve Nevada's heritage. You can go to the Legislative Gift Shop, too. They've got uh, Nevada 150 t-shirts. Awesome. And also uh, sh dress shirts and things of that nature. So it's a great way to support our state. I, I encourage everybody to show up to as many events as possible. There's going to be... They originally set up 150 events across the state of Nevada in one year, and I think they're actually going to do about 200, if not more. Excellent. Well, thank you for being on Nevada Trails. Pleasure, I really appreciate it. It's been Michael Smith reporting from Nevada Trails. Thank you very much.